The final topic for today's module will talk about how muscle contracts, and that is dealing with the interaction between actin and myosin to actually cause the uh, muscle uh, to shrink in size uh, and to kind of close that gap. Uh, the prevailing theory behind this is called the sliding filament theory. It was pr proposed in uh, 1954, so it's been uh, around uh, for a really long time. The idea is that uh, it proposes this mechanism by which the actin and myosin molecules will actually slide over each other to produce force um, in each sarcomere. And if you put a whole bunch of sarcomeres uh, in a line, which would make a myofibril, and you put a whole bunch of myofibrils in, uh, in a bundle uh, to make a muscle fiber, then if they all contract and work at the same rate, then you will actually shorten the muscle and cause a muscle contraction. Uh, this process is a very dynamic process, uh, a lot of moving parts, uh, and so um, ultimately the best way really to view this is to kind of watch an animation. So what I'm going to do now for you um, is play an animation that comes with uh, one of the textbooks um, that I own that I think is a really good, uh, simple model of how this works. Uh, the video is about five minutes long and really walks you through each and every step, and you can see all how all of these processes uh, work together uh, in order to shorten the sarcomere. So I'll play that now, and then I'll um, jump back on right at the end of the video and, and add some key points that I, that I want you to focus on. Skeletal muscles are composed of bundles of muscle fibers. Muscle fibers are long cylindrical cells containing several nuclei. Muscles will contract or relax when they receive signals from the nervous system. A neuromuscular junction is the site of the signal exchange. This is where the synaptic bulb of an axon terminal and muscle fiber connect. Muscle fibers are composed of many myofibrils. A myofibril contains contractile units called sarcomeres. Sarcomeres run adjacent to one another down the length of the myofibril. Each sarcomere consists of alternating thick and thin protein filaments, giving skeletal muscle its striated appearance. The muscle contracts when these filaments slide past each other. The thick filaments are myosin, which are anchored at the center of the sarcomere, called the M-line. The thin filaments are composed of the protein actin, which are anchored to the Z-lines on the outer edges of the sarcomere. Because the actin filaments are anchored to the Z-lines, the sarcomere shortens from both sides when actin filaments slide along the myosin filaments. Although the action between the filaments is described as sliding, the myosin filament actually pulls the actin along its length. The cross bridges of the myosin filaments attach to the actin filaments and exert force on them to move. This action is known as the sliding filament mechanism of muscle contraction. In this model, the sarcomeres shorten without the thick or thin filaments changing in length. A contraction begins when a bound ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. This causes the myosin head to extend and can attach to a binding site on actin, forming a cross bridge. An action called the power stroke is triggered, allowing myosin to pull the actin filament toward the M-line, thereby shortening the sarcomere. ADP and inorganic phosphate are released during the power stroke. The myosin remains attached to actin until a new molecule of ATP binds, freeing the myosin to either go through another cycle of binding and more contraction, or remain unattached to allow the muscle to relax. Muscle contractions are controlled by the actions of calcium. The thin actin filaments are associated with regulatory proteins called troponin and tropomyosin. When a muscle is relaxed, tropomyosin blocks the cross-bridge binding sites on actin. When calcium ion levels are high enough and ATP is present, calcium ions bind to the troponin, which displaces tropomyosin, exposing the myosin binding sites on actin. This allows myosin to attach to a binding site on actin, forming a cross bridge. Calcium ions are stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and are released in response to signals from the nervous system to contract. Neurotransmitter molecules are released from a neuron and bind to receptors, which depolarizes the membrane of the muscle fiber. 
the electrical impulse travels down the T-tubules and opens calcium stores. Calcium ions flow to the myofibrils where they trigger a muscle contraction. As the actin and myosin slide along each other, the entire sarcomere shortens as the Z-lines draw closer to the M-line. As the sarcomeres in myofibrils contract, the entire muscle fiber will shorten. When muscle fibers contract in unison, a muscle can produce enough force to move the body, allowing you to take notes. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the video uh, kind of explaining how skeletal muscle contracts. Again, I, I think that that video just does so much better job than me trying to illustrate with my hands this idea of a, a ratchet movement. If you're in the lab, though, you will get the chance to uh, see that in person as we'll cover this topic, uh, again, a little more in-depth and talk about how muscle contracts uh, and types of contractions and stuff in an upcoming lab. Uh, before we close this out, though, I wanted to hit on a couple things that I think uh, the video fell a little bit uh, short with. Uh, so when it uh, really talked about release from calcium, I, th I think it uh, a little bit understated uh, the kind of cool aspect that comes from how this works and how skeletal muscle is different from most other tissue. Um, so uh, if you think back to uh, classic uh, biology and you think of the cell, you have this nice little round globule and they have it surrounded by um, the cell membrane, which of course um, skeletal muscle has exactly uh, that. So uh, here's our neuron coming in uh, and releasing acetylcholine. Acetylcholine binds to its specific receptor on this cell membrane, and then we get depolarization, um, passing this action potential from the nerve then to the skeletal muscle, and it will travel down the uh, cell membrane. However, because if you think about how muscle actually works, is it isn't this nice round shape, right? It's, it's this long tube, and we don't actually have this um, kind of cell full of uh, cytoplasm uh, inside the cell that has all the proteins. In fact, what it really is, it's really um, jam-packed with actin and myosin, all put together into sarcomeres. Sarcomeres then put in series to cause myofibrils, which are then bundled all together to make this muscle fiber, right? Uh, and so if you kind of think about this circle, this tube that has myofibrils all the way in the middle, what we really need to do is get this action potential to go all the way to the middle and then to be able to stimulate all of those um, sarcomeres um, by hitting all of them with calcium and spreading them kind of throughout the entire muscle fiber as opposed to kind of just having the circle, having it at one point, and then try to filter through. As you can imagine, that would not make a very um, consistent muscle contraction. Uh, so the uh, muscle fiber is special because it has what's, um, what is labeled the transverse tubule. And essentially all this is is just a special property, an invagination of the uh, cell membrane which goes deep into the middle of the um, muscle. So you can see that here. This figure comes straight out of your book, uh, chapters uh, 88 and 89. Again, I highly recommend you read through this, especially if you're a reading learner. I prefer to read. Uh, I know a lot of students like videos, but I prefer to read. And it goes through each of these steps very specifically. Action potential, again, from the nerve to the um, uh, cell membrane uh, via acetylcholine uh, signaling. We then have an active potential propagated through the muscle membrane down into the T-tubules, um, which are, again, just special portions of the uh, cell membrane. Once uh, that um, goes through, we actually have a specialized protein called the dihydropyridine receptor, or the DHP. This is going to link the action potential then to the release of calcium. Uh, the DHP is somewhat in the uh, transverse tubule and somewhat in the SR. SR is commonly known as the sarcoplasmic reticulum. If you're curious about that word, reticulum again just kind of means network. So it's this network of um, a specialized endoplasmic reticulum called, for instance, muscle sarcomere or reticulum that kind of interweaves throughout all the skeletal muscle. And what its job then is having that kind of complex network is to be able to put calcium as close as it can to all of the um, actin molecules in order to uh, stimulate a strong contraction uh, and a, um, a very um, rapid contraction with all of the actin filaments. Uh, so DHP is actually the one that links. It will move, and then you will get a release of calcium then uh, from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Uh, so this formation kind of creates this uh, nice, pretty sarcoplasmic reticulum on one side, 
um, a T tubule down the middle, and a sarcoplasmic reticulum on the other side, uh, commonly called the skeletal muscle triad, which com com uh, contains those. Um, so again, you can read about those uh, in your book. I think those are really great. One other thing I, I wanted to hit on um, a little bit, just to point out that in the video, I thought the video was uh, slightly lacking when it talked about um, um, actin and troponin and how calcium interacts based on how we've taught it in this course. So I just want you to remember that again, um, when we talked about the structure of actin and troponin and tropomycin and how they all interact, if you remember that troponin actually has three different subunits, uh, one of those subunits is calcium specific. So remember calcium comes in, binds to troponin C, um, and that is its specific binding site uh, in order to be able to do that. Uh, so just um, a reminder that um, um, that troponin has three subunits, one for binding to actin, one for binding to calcium, and one for binding to uh, tropomycin in order for that all to work. So just kind of bringing that full circle. Uh, I hope you have uh, enjoyed this uh, first module in this section or module two um, overall and have learned a lot about uh, the structure and function of skeletal muscle. Uh, next class, we will get into um, uh, a little bit more of, I think, uh, what most students consider more fun when we start talking about exercise, how exercise is going to affect muscle, um, and how we can uh, look at force, how force is produced, how force is measured, um, and then the uh, long-term effects of uh, training, uh, both endurance and resistance training on skeletal muscle. So um, until then, I'll see you soon.